And since I didn't see any of you or anybody since last year, can I say Happy New Year to all of you? Bless God. So, strange times, isn't it? And it continues. But God is good. Thank you for that time of worship this morning, Eamon. It was lovely just to have that sensitivity um, to, the, to the heart of God and to the Father's heart for us. Um, you know, it's no great secret that at this time of the year, people take stock. They evaluate them, their lives. They, they consider their choices, maybe the way they've failed in the past. Um, and they decide to begin again, you know, a fresh start. We always, we love a fresh start. We love new beginnings. And that's why very often we talk about New Year resolutions. Apparently, you know, every January, um, well, maybe the last two years have been a bit different with COVID, but apparently gym owners, they experience a huge surge in business. You know, they take out all of their equipment, all the equipment that they have in the back, everything is going to be in use to meet the demand uh, of all the people who have decided that they're going to change their lifestyle. They're going to lose a few pounds, you know, they're going to spend less time in the office, they're going to go to the gym, they're going to... Um, spend less nights in the pub, they're going to go to the gym, they're going to whatever it is, they're going to cycle to work. Um, and you know, also, as, as Christians, we, we decide as well, we want to change, we want to pray more. I know this is always my heart, to pray more, to read more of God's word, to feel more connected with God in a, in a very real way. So it's not surprising that there's this within us uh, this desire to see change. But you know, the sad thing is, I suppose it's no great secret either that most of these resolutions are short-lived. You know, by the last week in January, apparently most of the gyms, um, they remove all the, the additional equipment. All that remains are the regulars, those who have always been coming. Those well-intentioned reformers have vanished. They have disappeared. Um, and of course, the bicycle starts to gather dust in the garage, waiting, of course, for the weather to improve because Irish weather and so on. We have good intentions, we do it in the summer. Um, you know, and sometimes maybe when we have, if we have decided on, on a, a Bible plan or a reading plan, you know, we, we, we do well, and then sometimes that falls behind. You know, we promise ourselves we'll catch up and we, we do all of these things. And you know, I, I've struggled as well in this area, not so much in making resolutions, but actually in, in keeping them and in fulfilling them. Um, you know, all through my younger years, I, I made resolutions every year, but rarely do I ever remember getting to the end. And you know, I was, I was reasonably good at following through on things, fairly committed, I'm fairly tenacious when I want to be. Um, but yet, I would fall short in some area. And, you know, wherever you fell short, it, was, it, it took the good from what you had tried to do. Um, so it seemed a bit like a lose-lose situation. And no matter how well I succeeded, there were always reasons to beat myself up and say, I failed again. And, you know, that can be a difficult place when you compound your guilt. You feel, yeah, I've, I've fallen again. Now, you know, I'm not, I'm not against New Year resolutions. I really am not. So if they're working for you, good. And I think it's good that we have some kind of resolve within ourselves that we want to change. And yet changing outside of, um, outside of God can be difficult. It can be difficult when we're just doing it in our own strength, in our own efforts. You know, there's so many books on you know, how to do it, how to do it this way, how to do it that way, how to uh, self-help books. And because we keep trying to find something else, um, some other way to, to, to do this. But, you know, deciding on doing something can be a great motivator. And it can be a chance to sort of wipe the slate clean and start again. Because personally, I like to make plans. I like to make improvements. I like to start projects. 
I like to complete projects. But plans that we make to improve ourselves that don't include the Lord, you know, they usually are destined for failure in some shape or form. I suppose what I am a great believer in is, and maybe this is something we can grasp today, is the idea of changing perspective. I can change my perspective. It's something each of us can do every day. And it can be something we can build on. You know, it's called incremental improvement. We're not trying to, to reach a goal. We're not trying to reach a target. We're not actually trying to get to a destination. But we're seeing continuous change in our lives. And you know, the benefits of this are enormous. The potential is, is unlimited. It's not sort of, it's not adding something extra to your lives, something else, another chore, another thing I have to do. Um, but rather, it's, it's just a different way of looking at the situations that we are facing every day. And we all face situations every day. And if we could look at them differently, if we could see them differently, life would be an awful lot easier. Life would be better. You know, what would it be like if we complained less about others? If we were less grumpy? If we were less argumentative, if we were less judgmental, if we were less intolerant, less insensitive, what would that be like? What would it be like for us if we were more appreciative, more content with what we have, more thankful, more forgiving, more able to overlook the faults of others, maybe more chilled, What would it be like if we could do as Paul exhorted the Philippians to give thanks in all circumstances knowing that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you? You know, you have a choice today. You know, when you leave this building, when you go home today, you have a choice. You can decide to start thinking differently. You know, it's not our circumstances that determine our feelings but rather it's our response, it's how we respond to those circumstances that determines how we feel about ourselves, about others, uh, and about life in general. So if we're waiting for our circumstances to change before we start thinking differently, then maybe we've got to ask ourselves some hard questions. You know, what do I do when my circumstances don't change? You know, we never envisaged that at the beginning of 2021 that we would be in a similar position in 2022. Well, it's not quite the same. We have a vaccine, we have boosters and so on. It is different. But we have all these variants and changes. Um, it's always changing. And people are still frightened. People are still vulnerable and feel, feel exposed. You know, and living with uncertainty, that causes anxiety. That, that increases anxiety for us when we don't know what the future looks like, when we can't see sort of what's, what's ahead and we don't know what is around the next corner. So, that's a rather long introduction. Let's open our Bibles. Second Kings. I want to look at a story in Second Kings this morning. Chapter eight, or sorry, chapter six. I'm going to read from verse eight. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place uh, about which the man of God had told him, thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, 
But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel uh, the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent there horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike the people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way and this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you, were, whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. You know, what, a, what a, an amazing story. And, you know, what was happening here was the, 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 king, the king of Syria was at war with the king of Israel. And everything that the king of, Israel, uh, the king of Syria planned to do became known to the king of Israel. So the king of Syria obviously suspected that there was a, tra a traitor in the camp, that there was a spy in the camp, there was somebody who was spilling the beans, somebody who was talking um, behind his back. But one of the servants came and said, no, 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 this isn't the case. Um, God is telling Elisha, the prophet, the words that the king, that you, a king, are speaking even in your bedroom, the privacy of your own room. And that information is passed to the king of Israel. So at this stage, Elisha had to be found. The king of Syria had to get it. He had to get this man. He had to stop him in his tracks. So they surrounded the city where Elisha was. And it's interesting, when they, when they rose in the morning, Elisha's servant arose, and he saw a huge army, huge enemy army, around the city. And Elisha rose, and he saw the greater army of God surrounding the other army. So you wonder, you know, how can two people look at the same situation and see it very differently? It's called perspective. You have a perspective, I have a perspective. And we come across this every day of our lives. People who see things differently. People who argue about basic things in life different perspectives, seeing it differently. So it's to do with the way you look at a situation. You know, we're all influenced, certainly by you know, our genetic makeup, our upbringing, um, our culture, our background, our attachment styles, um, our experience of significant others in our lives, learned behaviors, our outlook on life. And it's also based on our circumstances, our life experience, what we've experienced in life, our disposition, our propensity to be either more positive or negative. Maybe our disappointments in life, the knocks we've taken that we've endured along the way. So in summary, I suppose we see things very much through a particular lens. People can, be, people can be raised in the same house and see things quite differently. So it's not any one of those things. It can be a combination of things. So in this particular story, we see two men journeying together. There's a prophet and a servant. Now, they come from probably different backgrounds, different status, different roles in life. But in one sense, they probably have had similar experiences because the servant has always been with uh, his master. Yet we see two grown men 
looking at a situation and seeing it very, very differently. One saw the strength and the presence of the enemy. The other saw the strength and the presence and the provision of God. One saw with his physical eyes and the other saw with spiritual eyes. One saw from a place of fear, it was fear-based, while the other was faith-based. How do we look at our present situation? What do we think about the future? Are you coming at it from a place of hope or hopelessness? Differing perspectives can lead to disharmony. You know, many arguments, many people um, disagree on things. Um, and you know, when people are, when they take that view of, of um, you know, sort of black and white thinking, you know, that they're right, that they're, they're always 100% right. It's very hard to deal with people who are black and white thinkers. They're always 100% right. And they have no room for any other opinion. Nobody else has an opinion. This is the way it is. Um, but you know, two people can hold completely different opinions on the same situation, and that's okay. That's okay. You know, in this case, the enemy was very real. And, and both could see um, that there was an enemy. But for Elisha, I suppose he, he chose to look beyond what he, could present, what he could see at the moment. We find that hard to do, don't we? I find it hard to do, to look beyond. We just look very much at what is happening, where we're at, what's happening in our lives, what's happening in our family's life. And we, we struggle to see beyond that, to see the omnipotent hand of God. To, we fail to trust sometimes that God sees things differently. He sees the end from the beginning. And how often do we find ourselves limited and grounded only by what our eyes can see? We cannot see with the eyes of faith. You know, when difficulties come, and they, and they, they do come, whether it's health or financial or relationship breakdowns, employment problems, you know, we feel discouraged, we feel disheartened, we feel uh, devastated. But what if we could pause and just realize that this is something that is unforeseen, it wasn't in our plan, it's something unexpected, and it's something that is outside of our control. This is the time really when we come and just cast ourselves on God, on his mercy, that we come and as Amos was encouraged this morning, draw near to the Father, see the Father um, running towards us. You know, the one who, who calls us has promised never to leave us or forsake us. So this is an opportunity for us then to come in prayer, to come in praise, in adoration, to come and lay our lives before God, to come with petitions and, and just seeking his face, asking God for the things we need. You know, so even in scripture we see how God allows different perspectives, different views. He arranges it. And we see that verse in, in 2 Corinthians where he talks about the gospel being veiled. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So do you often wonder why people don't see things, people who are not Christians, see things very differently to the way you see things? We wonder sometimes, well, why can they not see it? How do they not know? And it's because the God of this world has blinded them that they cannot see. So how can we change our perspective? Let me tell you a story. This is a story I heard many years ago, and I, I've forgotten the detail. Um, but I know it, it, it encouraged me. So this is sort of my version 
of that story. If you can imagine four elderly occupants of a nursing home, and they're all confined to their beds. You know, John was the one who had the privilege of, of having his bed close to the window. Uh, it was a long, narrow room. And each morning his companions would, would ask John, John, tell us what's, what's going on outside? What's going out, on outside in the world? And each day John looked through the window and gave a descriptive account of what he saw. He saw a lovely green park. He saw majestic tall trees. He saw the birds making their homes there, all the various species. And John knew the species. He, he was familiar with them. He could describe their antics in great detail. He reported about the birds, that they were singing, they were flying, they were soaring in sync. He gave weather updates. Beautiful sunshine today. No, there's rain. Actually, there's some frost, and I can see snow on the mountains. He told them of families he saw, playing. Same families, coming on a regular basis. Children growing up, children playing ball, picnics together. He talked about the, the nearby road and the traffic he saw, and the cars and the colors and the models. He shared these images with his colleagues so that they could imagine what normal life was like. Day after day, they enjoyed participating in and visualizing this world that John opened to them every day. One day, however, John, he was well in his 90s, he just failed to waken up because death had visited him that night. His colleagues were grief-stricken to lose such a friend. He, he was family to them. They were all so close. After some days had passed, the most senior person in the room um, asked if he could be moved to the window where, where John was every day. Michael had the privilege of moving to his bed. And to his great amazement, Michael looked out the window and all he saw was a gray wall of a building adjacent, which was a huge disappointment to him. However, as they reflected on their loss, the loss of their dear friend John, they were so grateful for the many years of pleasure that John gave them. You see, John believed that, that if he could see life differently from how he was experiencing it, then life could be happier for him and for others. So the sadness of aging could be relieved somewhat by just a different perspective, by changing the narrative, by, view, by viewing life through a different and a positive lens, by using his memory to recall happy times, good times, when he was younger, when he was energetic, when he was full of life, when he was fish, when he was expectant. And yet, even in his dying years, John lived life to the full. So how are we viewing life? What's our lens like? How are we managing the challenges that life is presenting? Are we habitually complaining and always seeing the problems, the difficulties? You know, we cannot choose what happens in life. That's our circumstances. But we can choose how we respond. Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome and he told them not to conform to this world. Negative pessimism, doom and gloom. But he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you can think differently about situations, you will feel differently about them. The way we think about situations directly impacts how we feel about situations and about ourselves. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi as well, and he urged the believers there to start thinking differently. He encouraged them to think about the things that are true, 
things that are honorable, the things that are just, the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, things that are noble, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. He said, you think about these things. You think about these things. You know, you have to make the choice. You have to decide, yes, I will. What he's encouraging is that we stop thinking about negative things. That we focus on positive. Can we see something encouraging in this present challenge? Can we stop thinking about what is untrue and start thinking about what is true? Can we stop believing the lies that have been spoken over us and ask God for a fresh revelation of who we are in Christ? You know, many may have words spoken over their lives. You know, we hear it very often, people, you know, live with, under the cloud of this. You know, you are good for nothing. You never make anything of your life. Uh, you know, can't you be like your brother? Can't you be like your sister? Why can't you, your, your work quality, be, be as good as your colleagues and so on? And the list goes, is endless. But stop beating yourself up because of your failures, because of your shortcomings. Start recognizing that you are a work in progress, as we all are. Stop criticizing others. Start encouraging them. Stop moaning and groaning. Start praising and rejoicing. We're called to rejoice in all circumstances. Not to rejoice for the circumstances, but to rejoice in them as you're going through them, as you're experiencing them. How much nicer it is when you see your glass half full rather than half empty. So, as we finish, what can you see in your life today maybe that you might like to change? Maybe you've fallen into the trap of believing that, you know, life cannot change. You know, maybe it's you're dealing with, with your temper or your over-the-top reactions or feelings of inadequacy. You know, where you feel you always have to fight your own corner. You know, it's not easy to break old habits. They say it takes 40 days to break a habit. I'm sure that's an average. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. I think the best way, and I often say this to people, is the best way to change a habit is to replace it. You know, the idea of giving up something is very hard. You say, stop doing that. You've got to stop smoking. You've got to stop whatever it is. And that's very hard, and it's much easier if somebody says, instead, I will take up another habit, a less destructive habit. That's what I will do. And that helps, over time, to replace the one that is causing difficulty. So today, let's see, I was supposed to be speaking last Sunday. It was the beginning of a year. It's still the beginning of a new year. Maybe you can just... Um, Reflect on where you're at, what things you would like to change, what things you would like to be different in your life. And you can begin from today. Because if you begin to think differently about your situation, you'll be more hopeful. If you begin to think more positively about your situation, you can find that maybe God can answer your prayer. Maybe it hasn't been answered up to this point. But something can change, something can shift. That shift can start with you today. So let us just pray. If there's things in your heart, just hold them before the Lord. Maybe there's been disappointments. Maybe you felt broken. Maybe, you, maybe you're feeling this morning at the end of your tether. Maybe you feel, I can't take any more. Well, you know, you can cast your burden on the Lord today. He loves you. He loves you, each one of us in this place, each one of us connecting today on Zoom. 
Jesus loves you. The heart of the Father is for you. Lord, would you visit us this morning? Would you visit your people? Would you help us to see things differently? Lord, would you open our eyes as Elisha prayed for his servant that he too would see the things that he could see. Lord, I want to see the things that you see. I want to see the way you see things. I want to say that you see the way you see this world, the way you see my life, the way you see my family. And I want to believe that God is good. God is good all the time. So we, we hold firm to your goodness, to your faithfulness, because you have proved yourself in the past to be utterly faithful. And you don't leave us or forsake us. So we thank you, Lord. We just pray you bring us forward on this journey. Let life be different for us from today forward as we move forward in your love, in your grace, in your care. We just bless you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.